a lot of people are calling me. They were like, oh, you heard Andrew Cuomo. He says, shut down all gyms. I'm like, I have 10 people working out in the studio. I'm like, well, he said 50% yesterday. Now we got to shut down. I turned on my computer right away, sent people a Google uh, video link. And then we just switched over to Zoom because it's just more compatible. But it was something that just clicked right in, right in front of me. Um, I don't, I don't know what happened, you know, but I, I guess. What, ha what happened is when you're trained by the streets, adversity and no is as common as success. When you're trained in the classroom, it's a little bit scarier. And we're so lucky to have him. Welcome, Koss. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Koss, good morning. Thank How you, are Gary. you? I'm good. I'm good. I just taught a workout this morning, so I feel good. You're ready. Um, yeah, yeah. Koss, I think, you know, why, why don't you give some context? to the audience, tell us about your, t feel free to take five minutes to uh, establish your incredible story. Yeah, so Combody is a prison style boot camp, which was the, which we hire people coming out of the prison system to teach fitness classes. It was all derived from my prison experience. I was born and raised in the Lower East Side, still live here, probably gonna die here. Um, and, and I grew up in a neighborhood that it was very, very drug infested in the 80s and 90s. And as a, as a kid, I saw that as an avenue of making money. Um, my mom immigrated from the Dominican Republic when she was six months pregnant with me. She ended up working in a, in a factory. Uh, she babysat me under her, her sewing machine. And that's how I lived. Um, and, and as a kid, I would see other kids, you know, with the Nintendo, Atari, uh, Game Boys and all that stuff. And, I, and that's what I wanted. I wanted other stuff. Um, and every time I asked my mom for something, she was like, Mijo, I can't afford it. And so that would frustrate me and I would do anything. I was collecting like, can't, going to door to door in my building, collecting bottles, cans, changing them for nickels in the bodega, opening up the fire hydrant, cleaning cars. Uh, but I seen the guys that were on my corner who, you know, wore the chains, you know, had the girls, the cars. Uh, and I saw that they were making money. There was, it was crazy how, uh, there was heroin lines down the block, you know, people buying drugs off of them. And, um, and I saw that as an avenue of becoming rich. Um, you know, I, I remember in school, a teacher said, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I wanted to be rich. And, um, and I saw these guys making money. So I followed the experience. Uh, and, and I started selling drugs at 13. And by the age of 19, I was making over $2 million a year running one of the largest drug delivery services in New York City. At 23, I was arrested, sentenced to seven years. And uh, that's when I found out I had all these health issues. My cholesterol levels were through the roof. The doctors and the physicians said in prison that if I didn't start exercising or eating correctly, that I could probably die of a heart attack within five years. And wow, that extreme. I was, I was 23 years old. They placed me on medication, and I was like, uh, I'm not going to die. What are you talking about? And, uh, and I went back to my cell that day. And just started thinking about my son. Uh, my son's 13 now. Um, and I just started thinking about that. I wanted to come home for him, you know, and, and I was like, I can't die in this place. And so I went out to the yard and, uh, and I started running laps. People would call me Fat Forrest Gump, joking around. And uh, it was. How much did you weigh at the time? I was 231. Really? Um, came home 160. Wow. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I'm always fascinated by mindset. When, when you got to that level at 19, did you just delusionally believe that you were invincible and that the system would never catch you? Or did you have kind of that underlining um, anxiety that you just kind of knew at some point the gig was going to be up, but you were so deep, there was just no way to get out? Uh, both. Both. Both, but I, I think I was also delusional that I, I felt legal. I felt like I could do whatever I want. I was not going to get caught. I was not serving. I was not dealing drugs. Uh, everything was being passed over to me. So we changed the way we sold drugs. You know, back in the day, I grew up and I saw individuals like standing on the corner doing drugs. I made a whole delivery service. I made 10,000 business cards. I went up to every person that I thought used drugs on Wall Street and went up to these fancy bars. I wore a business suit. I had everybody on my team wear a business suit. And then I had a connection where we were renting cars um, for really cheap. And, uh, and then everything went down. Um, yeah, I remember having seven cell phones because each phone only held 1,500 to 2,500 contact numbers. 
And so every time I had a, so those were my clients and, and we were actually like literally picking up the phones with two, two like, hello, where you at? 23rd and 3rd, 14th and 5th. Wow. Give me 10 minutes. Give me five minutes. Uh, there'll be a Toyota Camry on downstairs on the corner of the, the Northwest corner of this blah, blah, blah. And that's how we was operating. So I had a whole dispatch service. I had about 20 cars, uh, two shifts. Um, it was just a, a crazy, crazy time. I, I thought I was not going to get caught. Were you stunned when it happened? I was surprised. I was caught off guard. Yeah, I was caught off guard. Um, I remember the day they, they, they caught me. I was, it was, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but you got to remember the next house. And so we were operating with yes. ourselves and, uh, <laughs> and we were sending, yeah, brr, yeah. And we're like telling our drivers like 23rd and 3rd and I'm sending all my drivers um, to, to different spots. And, uh, and they were, and, and they were, I don't know if you remember, but it used to get caught and be like, beep, yep. beep, when it used to not work. And, and I was like, damn, this guy's not picking up and the customer's waiting on the corner. And uh, my, my drivers were getting caught one at a time as I was sending them because our phones were being tapped. And Got so I'm it. sending the, the feds with, you know, picking up my drivers one at a time. And it was just one shift, so it was 10 of us. Um, and then at the end of the day, they came right at uh, the stash house. Uh, I, they caught me coming out of the stash house. Uh, I, I got caught with about a kilo and a half of coke and money and all this other stuff. But and the rest um, is history. What yeah. about what about the next chapter? You 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 have seven. Did you serve all seven years? No, I served uh, total six years. And so, when when did the shift happen in your mind? You know, because uh, you know, I grew up in some interesting scenarios myself so uh several of my friends have spent some substantial time in prison and and i'm always fascinated by the mindset some people come out doubling down like just doubling yeah. down like fuck it and other people really make that shift when did you make the shift in your process that you're going to come back out and you're going to do it you're going to do it differently yeah. and and how did that go down Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, towards the end of my incarceration, I, I was about to be released uh, in this early release program called Shock. You probably know about it. Uh, it's like ex-Marines turn correctional officers to beat the crap out of you. You save three years to your sentence. Um, so I, I was about to come home early. And, uh, and, and I remember one day uh, the officer calls me down to the bubble and he says, you have to report to the medical unit. So I go to the medical unit. I, I'm thinking I'm going to be doing my teeth. I've been waiting on a dental list for like three years. You, you know, dentists in, in prison take a long time. Yep. Uh, so I go, I go down to the medical unit and this officer places me on the wall and, uh, and they do random searches. And so he pl places me on the wall. He starts searching me and he starts searching me really aggressively. Uh, he puts my hands really low to the, to the wall and I'm almost like holding a plank and, uh, and I, I shift my body a little bit as he got between my legs because uh, I felt comfortable. And he punched me behind my head and he said, today's not my day, don't fuck with me. And I dropped down to the ground and, um, and, and I felt like he knocked me out for a little bit. I saw stars and I, I, I got up and I turned around on officers to, to avoid another hit. So as soon as I turned around, they pressed the pin. The pin is this button in this walkie-talkie. As soon as that button is pressed, the whole alarm for the whole prison goes off. Mm. And uh, and they sent me they sent me into solitary confinement after they beat me up. About a half a dozen officers beat me up. They shackled me. They walked me to the box. I was about to be released in two months. I was about to be released in two months. And because of this incident, I'm now serving my three more years in prison. My God, so I'm devastated. I'm devastated. I'm in the box. I'm pacing back and forth. Uh, I'm in now 24 hour lockdown. It's about 105 degrees in there. There's no AC. There's no fan. I'm walking naked. And um, and this officer walks by my, my door and he passes me in a, the, the food slot, um, a paper pen and an envelope. So I quickly grabbed that paper pen and envelope. I started writing a letter to my family telling them I need a lawyer. I need to fight this case. Um, this guy's trying to give me, you know, another case, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then I closed the letter in this envelope and I realized I had no stamp to send out this letter with. And and so I felt hopeless. I felt devastated. I started banging the wall. I started banging my head on the wall. And um, and I got frustrated and laid on my bed. And it was not until like three, four days in solitary 
when my sister finds out that I was in solitary, my sister's like Mother Teresa's child, <laughs> super religious type of person. Uh, she writes me a letter and says, you know, you haven't called home. Well, I called the prison. We found out you're in solitary confinement. We're, we got your back. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, all I want you to do is read Psalm 91 from the Bible. And I'm like, Psalm 91? I don't need no religion. I need, I need a lawyer. Like, I need, I don't, I'm like, fuck God. And so I take that letter, threw it in the corner of my cell, laid back there. Uh, and But oh, the only thing I had in my cell was this Bible that she gave me on early on in my incarceration. So the only thing that follows you through your whole incarceration is a religious item. Now, I'm still not a super religious person, but I do believe in a higher power. Uh, and out of boredom, I decided to open up to Psalm 91, uh, which states, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my shelter, my fortress, my God, and who I trust. And as soon as I read those words, the stamp fell out of my Bible in between my pages. And that was the stamp that I needed to send out this message to my family to let them know about the whole story of what happened to me. Wow. And uh, at, that, at that point, chills ran down my body. I felt like there was something bigger than myself. Um, and I prayed. I prayed, uh, you know, not to go back to the streets. I said, uh, I need to find a different avenue. And, and at this time, I already was training. I already lost weight. Fitness was my passion. And I said, God, I'm, I'm, I want to I wanna start a fitness company. So this is where uh, Combody was all derived. Yeah. Who was your first client? And, my first client, my first paying client, my first client was my mom. She, uh, <laughs> so I came home, I was living on her couch. Uh, she was renting, she was renting her couch for about 200 bucks a month. And, um, yeah, but my first real, real paying client was his, uh, CEO of, uh, I think it was real New York. He was, he was, a, a, a real estate agent, but he was super wealthy guy was running around the block. And uh, I remember having a broken piece of pipe on Forside. I don't know if you know the Lower East Side like that. On Forside in Rivington, mm -hmm. there's a soccer field. So I stuck a, a pipe and I'm doing pull-up training there. I got my mom, I got my aunt, I got another neighbor there. So I'm just going after anybody I know from the neighborhood trying to get them to train. And this guy just runs up and tries to do a pull-up. And I'm like, yo, that's my pull-up bar. Like, you got to pay me for that. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. How much do I owe you? And I was, how much do you charge? I was like, I was not even charging at that point. I had no idea what I was going to be charging. And I was like 200. He was like 200 bucks for semi by private training. I was like, yeah. And so he was like, can I join the class? So we joined a class right after I walked down to the ATM. I was like, yo, boom. I had no contract. I was running the business out of, with an iPhone 4. I had no idea how to use Twitter, Instagram. But you, you missed, know, missed all that. whole time lapse. Yeah, yeah I, went, I went from a flip phone to a touchscreen phone. And it was just a whole different world it's just Flintstones getting the Jetsons for me and 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 it just went I mean it basically the skill set that built the first business is the skill set that builds the second business I, I did the same guerrilla marketing tactics I made 10,000 business cards flyers postcards I went to the B train D train F train started sticking them in the little slots ladies and gentlemen my name is Carl Smarte I started Combody a fitness program where we hired formerly incarcerated people to teach fitness classes. I told my story in like 10 seconds and, uh, and just kept doing that and just kept doing that. And uh, even I was taking Uber pools on purpose, lift share rides on purpose, because that'll give right, me an hoping, opportunity to yep. get people right in front of me. And I'm just pitching and be like, oh, you look like you work out, you know, and then just start the conversation there. Or a what? lot of females wearing yoga pants too. So yes. that was my target market. <laughs> Understood. So what um what's with the business now? Yeah, today we've trained over fifty thousand people. We've hired over forty individuals coming out of the prison system, have a zero recidivism rate. Um right now, due to COVID, it's been a blessing for us. Uh we, we quickly pivoted doing digital stuff. We're doing on demand nine dollar a month uh workout videos, ten to twenty minute workout videos. Uh, that grew up to 50% during COVID. And then we've been doing like live stream Zoom classes. Uh, so Amy took a class. Uh, she was out there in the park uh, while Andrea's doing the virtual stuff in the Zoom. So we're just connecting the computer, uh, having people in front of us in the park now uh, six feet apart. Um, so it's been more of a blessing, man. It's, you feel, it's do, you feel, do you feel the fact that you, the environment you grew up in made you mentally conducive to shifting and adjusting immediately when shit hit the fan? I, I think absolutely. I mean, I was the first fitness studio that pivoted right away. Uh, 
a lot of people are calling me. They were like, oh, you heard Andrew Cuomo. He says, shut down all gyms. I'm like, I have 10 people working out in the studio. I'm like, well, he said 50% yesterday. Now we got to shut down. I turned on my computer right away, sent people a Google uh, video link, and then we just switched over to Zoom because it's just more compatible. But it was something that just clicked right in right in front of me. Um, I don't I don't know what happened, you know, but I, I guess. What, ha- what happened is when you're trained by the streets, adversity and no is as common as success. When you're trained in the classroom, it's a little bit scarier. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. Yep. Listen, I, 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 we're going to have to have you back on again because there's so much more to dig into here. Cause I really appreciate you, man. Keep pushing. No, thank you. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I, I hope to see you work out with me. So. Andrea's pushing me hard, so I know I'll have to deliver at some point. We'll talk soon. <laughs>